Hello, welcome to Book Talk. I'm your host, Anthony Moirore. At Book Talk, we get to have an author come and tell us about his book or her book. And today we have a great guest with us who has interesting stories. So many books he's written. And um, you tell us how he finds his own time to write great and many books, because many of us don't have a way to get started or keep going. So without taking one more minute, I'm going to invite to the studio, David Polly. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Anthony. Oh, Thank you for having me. You? Yeah, we are. I'm very good. Thank you. How are you? Yeah. So where are you uh, and what's happening where you are? Um, I am in Canberra, Australia. Uh, my family and I moved here about seven years ago. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer that works for a small company here in town. Um, and you know, have have a dog, couple of cats. Um, I'm I'm a classically trained French chef. Uh, back during my divorce, back in the day, I went off to Paris to Cordon Bleu to uh, get my culinary degree. So mm. I cook and then I write and just you know try try to enjoy things. Mm, beautiful. Now, uh, so you're in Australia? Is that where you were yes. born and grew up? No, I grew up in suburban Chicago where they filmed all those 80s movies like Home Alone and Risky Business and um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off was filmed at my high school. So I've actually, a friend of mine earlier in life had been living in the house where the Ferrari goes out the window. So I've actually been, actually physically been in that house and looked out the window where the, you know, the, the car winds up crashing. Um, I thought that that was reality, you know, just, you know, the, an upper middle class suburb, everybody sort of doing the same thing. And then I moved out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, where they filmed parts of Breaking Bad in front of my office. Um, and the, the, sh the Breaking Bad show was no exaggeration. Um, Albuquerque is incredibly violent. It's, it, it's just everybody's got a gun. Everybody's poor. Everybody's angry at somebody. So it it's just yeah it wasn't it was a scary place to to live for 20 years. So thankfully we were able, we were able to migrate to Australia and get away from that crazy place. Mm. And how has it been in Australia for the time that you've been there? Oh, it's wonderful. Nothing bad happens. If somebody oh. if someone gets shot, if something somebody gets killed in Australia, that's front page news. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, the town we live in has one or two murders a year. Um, Albuquerque last year had 120 and they're the same size. Whoa. So, Whoa. yeah, plus uh, Albuquerque was 140 criminal arrests per night. 140 people getting arrested by the cops every night. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, story. exactly. You, 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 didn't, you didn't make eye contact with the guy next door to you in the car because he might shoot you just for looking at him. Oh. So, Oh yeah, no, no, no. no. It, it, I, I, yeah, yeah. I kind of have a have a feeling now where you get the stories to feel those those so many books that you've written. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah. It was it was just amazing. I mean, twenty, and I I've only scratched the surface. I've only I only went back and did probably the last four or five years in my in, in the expensive janitor. And then the sequel, Expensive Janitor, A Deeper Clean. I only did, you know, I had some selective stories, but there's, there's, I've written down hundreds and hundreds of different, you know, reminders as to, you know, other stories I can tell. So when I get back to writing the third book, um, Expensive Janitor, The Full Polish, I'll go ahead and put more of those ridiculous stories in there. Mm. And at what point did you start writing? I mean, why did you start in um, school or when you were old? No, was that was I, I all through high school, through grade 12. I was told that you know, my grammar was atrocious. I couldn't make paragraphs. Um, my ideas, while they were colorful and creative, you know, didn't didn't fit the mold that they were trying to put me into. So I never thought I could ever write anything other than, you know, you know, class papers or um, you know, law school exams, that sort of idea. So it wasn't until um, I got divorced and I had a lot of time that I started writing a different book, 
and started getting chapters there and page became chapters, became a book. My brother was really excited about it. Um, and then I originally self-published, didn't get anywhere. The reviews for the first version said there's, you know, too many punctuation mistakes and too many other pro structural problems with the story. So I paid an editor a lot of money to go ahead and basically teach me how to write, get my ideas down so they make sense for people. Um, so that was, the, you know, that I didn't write janitor there because that was, I, I didn't want to bring my, my day job home with me. So what I did was when I got to Australia and it sort of, you know, settled down to about a year or so, or two years, I wound up working um, for the government. And it was a bizarre, absolutely bizarre situation where we had a, you know, super executive level two manager who's supposed to be overseeing 100 people, and he only had five people to oversee. And everybody that was there on the team were, you know, people that had finished year 12 at best. Um, that that guy, as far as we could tell, was having a relationship with one of the, one of his you know team members, even though he was married. So I was the weird guy, and they didn't you know I didn't get along with the group, so they put me in a back conference room with only one light bulb, and they didn't give me any work to do. Hour after hour, day after day, uh, I had to sit there. I mean, I, I would ask the manager. I said, "Do you have anything for me to work on?" And he'd say, "Well." What about that one project? I said, I've already finished it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'm sure I'll have something for you to do later today. Well, yeah, that never happened. Um, so eventually he assigned one of the members of his team that um, had, had not even finished year 12 and appointed her my supervisor. So I'm sitting there with a graduate degree in law reporting to somebody who doesn't understand anything that I say, doesn't understand any questions I might have. It was completely hopeless. So I rapidly got tired of just sitting, staring at my own computer. Um, so I just, you know, I went ahead and started writing expensive janitor. I had had lots of, you know, 20 years, 25 years of experience in <clears throat> dealing with the criminals of Albuquerque and just living in a very dangerous, very, very weird place. Um, so I just thought finally I could start you know, just telling my story, sort of getting it out, making it uh, cathartic. You know, just trying to get through all the stress of all the years of living in just, you know, a, you know, a weird, weird place. Um, so I just I basically just started telling the stories from memory. I just, you know, these are all <clears throat> my personal experiences. All the stories are true. Um, I changed the names to so I wouldn't get sued and protect innocent people or maybe not so innocent. Um but nonetheless, I mean, that was, you know, that that was sort of how it all began. Um, and it was really easy to write because it was just first person narrative. I'm just telling a story just like I, I would tell stories to my family and friends back in the States who couldn't believe what I was having to deal with. Um, and now here in Australia, when I've I had my I've had Australian solicitor friends read both books um, and at the food club where I cook, they you know, they, they one of the other diners asked. Paul, my friend, um, who's also a lawyer, and said, "Do you have you ever had any of these clients that David's had?" And he says, "In 30 years, no. Thank God, no. I don't ever want to know any of those people. I never want to go to that place." He said, "It's great to read about, but it makes me very thankful for being here in Australia." Oh. Um, mm -hmm. So, no, it was so it, the the even though we didn't do any violent crime across the street from my office was the heroin methadone clinic. So once a week, they'd line up around the block to get their methadone. And sometimes they'd start wandering around the halls, stoned out of their minds in the building. So my office manager, who was nervous, um, started you know, would wear her gun on her hip around the office. So just to make sure that in case somebody got rowdy, she'd be able to, you know, shoot them. And when I met, when she, her boyfriend at the time was a police officer. And when I mentioned to him, I said, aren't you surprised about this? And he goes, no. She goes, those people are nasty. She needs her gun. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> not, not in suburban Chicago anymore. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was, that was just sort of the environment. Um, so yeah, it was it was a re really easy, relatively easy story to write. I got it done in about three or four months, um, and then went back, polished it up, cleaned it up, sent it off to my um, editor. Sent it off to my editor, um, and he thought it was you know my, the publisher. They thought it was hysterical. 
So they were really excited to send. They sent me a contract, that, you know, the next day after I sent them the manuscript. Oh, beautiful. And what are some of the stories if you would give us a glimpse of it? Okay. <clears throat> so every day, and this is every single day I pull into the parking structure. Um, and I have two ways to leave the parking structure, or actually three. I could walk walk all the way down the ramp, in, which takes a while, or I can take the stairs, or I can take the lift. Those are my two choices. Now, on any given day, you look in the stairs, and there's two drunks passed out on the stairs, usually having thrown up on each other. Sure. Um, and they're usually still moving. So trying to navigate a narrow stairway with two drunks passed out on the stairs, not a great idea. So then you go into the lift, which the drunks used as their bathroom. So the just disgusting. But even worse, from the people at the methadone clinic, they would put their used syringes poking up out of the railing inside the lift, hoping that somebody would back into it and stab themselves and get AIDS, Hep C, whatever other viruses they had. So it was just, yeah, it was just awful. Uh huh. So, so oh, it's horrible. So you walk down the sidewalk, and the first person you meet in my book is somebody that's coming towards me, and he, and you know, who's twitching like this and barely, you know, could barely stand up. And I'm sitting there, and he goes, "Hey, man, can you give me any money for the bus?" And I thought to myself, "The bus? Seriously? Come on! Well, just tell me that you need money for drugs or alcohol." Be honest. Um, and I was in a bad mood that day. So I'm like, Buzz, where do you need to go? Well, well, why are you asking me that, man? I need, I need money for the bus. I said, right, I got that. Where do you need to go? Jail, hospital, you know, clinic? What do you, where you got to go? Why, why do you keep asking me, man? I said, because I'm not going to give you any money. But I have a car. I can give you a ride. Tell me where you need to go. And he says, the hell with you, man. If you ain't giving me any money, quit wasting my time. I said, time is all you have until your liver fails. And he's like, ah, I'm out of here. And he goes staggering down the street. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just, yeah. I mean, that's just, that was in every, you couldn't walk 10 feet downtown in Albuquerque without somebody asking you for money, somebody looking like they might want to mug you or rob you or just shoot you because they're having a bad day. Mm. Um yeah, it was, and there was no, there really wasn't any spa any place in the downtown part of Albuquerque where you could, you know, get away from these, you know, yucky people. I mean, it was just, they, they were just, it was so bad. Albuquerque is one of those cities that um, has a fairly mild climate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so Santa Fe, which is the rich town in the state capital, about 100 kilometers up the road, well, about once a month would round up the homeless and the drug addicts and give them a $50 bill, put them on a bus for Albuquerque and tell them don't come back because that's where all the tourists are going to Santa Fe. No tourists wanted, there's nothing to see in Albuquerque, but everybody mm -hmm. wanted to go see how pretty Santa Fe was and all that other stuff. Um, and then we would hear reports that other cities were paying the homeless and the drug addicts from New York to Chicago to Cleveland to wherever and getting them a one-way bus ticket somewhere warm, whether it was Florida, Texas, New Mexico, or Arizona. It was just, it was sort of a magnet. Um, one of the first clients you'll meet in my story <clears throat> comes to see me. Um, and I'm, I'll make this as G-rated as I can because it's really pretty damn funny. Um, comes to see me and his first question is, am I going back to jail? And I said, let me look at your paperwork. I said, were you drunk? And he says, yep, I was drunk. I said, is that a problem? I said, no, no, I, I, I drink too much. I understand. I said, now, were you naked? And he goes, yes, I was naked. Is that a problem? And I said, no, I'm, I'm drunk and naked when my wife lets me be. Um, I said, next question. I said, were you driving? And he says, yes. I said, now we're getting into problem. So I said, did you get pulled over? Yes. Was it a lady, the female police officer that pulled you over? Yes. Did you ask if you and your wife could finish having makeup sex before exiting the vehicle? Yes. Did you get out of the vehicle? Yes. Were you completely naked? Yes. Did you realize you were standing in the snow? No. Uh-huh. Did you then, while trying to do the roadside sobriety test, did you fall on top of the female officer? Yes. Okay. Did you ever find your clothes? No. Okay. Um, weren't in the back of your truck? No. Okay. Um, 
Now, you blew your alcohol score was a 0.27, which was over three times the legal limit. Is that correct? And he goes, that's what the papers say. I said, and this is your seventh arrest for drunk driving? Yep. I said, then I can answer your first question. Yes, you're going back to jail. And he thought, yeah, he thought I'd had a Harry Potter magic wand and I could just wave my hand over the whole thing and make it disappear. And I'm just looking at him. I'm like, what possible? <laughs> what? How could you, you know, manage to do this? So every month I thought I'd hit the bottom of the, of the, the ladder. I didn't think I could get any further down the stupid and weird ladder. Every month I was wrong. Every month somebody came into the office with some other absolutely, you know, unbelievable story that, you know, a real, a short and easy story was a guy that got pulled over and he comes to my office and again, asks if he's going back to jail. And I looked at his paperwork. I said, did you actually offer the, the cop a shot of whiskey from the open bottle on your lap? Yeah, I was just trying to be friendly, bro. And I said, and uh, how, how'd that work out for you? He goes, not so good. Can you believe it? They arrested me. Yeah, I can believe it. I said, your alcohol was three times the legal limit. And he goes, well, yeah, but is that bad? Yes. Yes, that's bad. I said, this is your third arrest for drunk driving. Yeah. I said, how about next time you drive first and then drink when you get home? Would that make more sense? You wouldn't get arrested anymore. And he's like, yeah, but I got lonely. So, you, of course, you decided to go driving. Do you remember who you were going to go see? No, it's all kind of hazy. Okay. All right. And, yeah, you're probably going back to jail. I'll do my best, but, you know, it's pretty mm. pretty standard. Right? Yeah. Seems you have so many hilarious stories in the book. Uh, now, wh why did you choose the uh, expensive janitor as the title of it? Oh, that's an easy one, <clears throat> because that's what I saw myself as, as an expensive janitor. If you mess up your life, I'll clean it up for you, but it's going to cost you. Okay. So that's what I did. I mean, no, nobody ever came to me before they made their life a mess. <laughs> nobody ever thought, gee, let's ask the lawyer before we do something stupid and get arrested. Mm. No, no, no. They had to, uh, they had, they had to go ahead and do that. Um, one of the cases were was that I haven't put in the books yet. It's one for the third book that I'm still writing. Was uh, um, it was a story of a guy who is was African American is African American, very large man, used to play uh, American gridiron NFL uh, football in college. He was huge, you know, three hundred pounds. Um, and he said that the white cops had a, had a taste civil rights. And I said, that's probably true. I mean, that's what white cops do in Albuquerque. And I started reading the paperwork and started shaking my head. I said, were you sitting outside naked? Yes. On your grandmother's porch? Yes. Were you drinking? Oh, I was drunk. I, it, the, the cops arrested me. I said, for being drunk sitting on your grandmother's porch? And he goes, well, there might be a little bit more to it. I, and I flipped over to the next page. I said, ah, were you shooting your gun from grandmother's porch? Oh, yeah, I was shooting the gun at anyone or anything in particular. Oh, no, just shooting it. I like the noise. I said, OK. And uh, when the cops arrived, did you put the gun down? No, I pointed it at them. I said, I closed my eyes and I said, do you realize how close it was that you would have been shot and killed by pointing a gun at a police officer? And he says, yeah, maybe looking back, that wasn't a great idea. I said, no, no, it wasn't a good idea. I said, uh, and, and I said, and then, then he said, they tasered me like 10 times. I said, sir, you're a very large man. I said, then they had, I said, then they had to get out the net. And he goes, yeah, I wasn't going with those crazy cops. And then they couldn't fit you in the back of the squad car because you were too big to fit in the door. So they had to call for the special wagon to come pick you up. And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay. And I said, you have a criminal history. And he goes, no, 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 I don't. This is the first time I've ever been arrested. I said, okay, I can make it all go away. I said, probably without any charges showing up on your record, as long as you do what I tell you to do when we go to court. So we go to court and we're sitting there and I make, I've cut a deal. The charges are all going away. He's not going to have a criminal record. And when the judge asks, you know, the judge asks him if he has any questions and he goes, yeah, your honor. 
when do I get my gun back? And the judge says, sir, you don't get your gun back. Okay. You don't get to have a gun anymore. Mm -hmm. And then he says, well, I got a right to have a gun. And she said, sir, we can tear up this plea deal and we can go to trial and you can do a year in prison. And she goes, and you still won't have a gun. What would you like to do? He's, and the client looks at me and goes, that's not right. I should have a gun. I said, no, no, you shouldn't have a gun. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. So he left the courtroom grumpy. He was a free man, no conviction on his record, but he was very angry that his very expensive gun had been confiscated by the police. Now, the courtroom is such an interesting place to be. And I remember one friend who told me of this story of um, uh, someone who had been accused of uh, uh, rape. That's a horrible event for someone yeah. to be raped about. And uh, I mean, to be um, uh, accused of. So they have gone to this courtroom and they are, uh, I mean, he's being asked, uh, did you do that? And then, okay, the case was postponed to an, a, later, a later date and then the accused and the, the, the witnesses were there and the, the one who had brought the case forward was there. And then an interesting thing happened and I, <laughs> I find this very uh, laughable. Uh, by at the point that the judge was going to sentence the rapist, uh, she saw the rapist lifting up his hand, and I think that's the uh, process of the case by, uh, where you come from, where you can plead uh, not guilty. You can, before the case has been brought forward or you've been sentenced, you can uh, plead. And then the accused is lifting the hand, and the one who has brought the case forward is lifting the hand up. And then the judge asked, what, what do you have to plead before I sentence you? And you and the, the one who has brought the case is also lifting up the hand. I said, Your Honor, we want to tell you that uh, we actually got married. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, how, that's a how, great how does that case go? <laughs> yeah. Uh, how does, yeah, it's it, an interesting place. I can understand I and I can imagine the stories, the many stories that are in the expensive janitor, the books. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I it it's one of my favorite stories was um a woman that came to my asking if I would do domestic violence work, and I said no, I don't like mean people. And she goes, um she goes, well, I, I, I'm his wife. I'd like to come in and see if you'll take his case. And I said, okay. So the woman comes to my office and she's the strangest looking woman I've ever seen. She's about five foot six by five foot six by five foot six. She's a cube, like a refrigerator. Mm. And she has a hard <laughs> time getting through my, my office door. Uh -huh. And she's wearing a Walmart uniform with her name on it. And I, I said, I, I told her, I said, I don't want to be rude. I'd ask you to take a seat, but I don't think you'll fit in the chair. And she goes, oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll stand up. And I said, okay, um, what happened? She goes, to me? I said, sure, let's start there. What happened to you? And she said, when I was in high school, um, a friend of mine got in a contest to be a bodybuilder, and they got some money. So I thought I could be a bodybuilder. I said, uh-huh. What happened? She said, well, I couldn't, aff I couldn't afford to buy legal steroid drugs, so I bought illegal steroid drugs. I said, what do you mean illegal? They're all illegal. She goes, yeah, but we don't we don't know where these drugs came from. Oh, good. And you started, you had no idea, so you just started, oh, I started using a vial a day. I said, then I got all these weird muscles and all these weird lumps. I said, oh, okay. Well, what happened? Well, I tried to exercise, but it just got worse. Did you stop using the drugs? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I thought if I just kept, kept going, I'd eventually get strong enough to win the bodybuilding contest. I said, Right. Okay. I said, now tell me about why you're here. And she goes, oh, well, my husband and I were drinking, of course, um, in the caravan park. Right. Um, and he's a little guy. I said, yeah. And he slapped me. I said, oh, uh, this, is, this isn't going to be good. She goes, no. I grabbed him by his collar of his shirt and the belt of his pants, threw him over my head, through the window of the caravan, onto the windshield of his truck. He shattered the windshield and his shoulder. Took him 25 minutes when they got there to pull him out of the windshield. I said, oh. And they arrested him? Yeah, because he started it. 
And I said, okay, all right. Um, considering you're the victim and he's the one that got hurt, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll take this case. We'll go to the judge. So we go to court that day and the, the husband comes in and he's still, he's got his arm all locked up like this, you know, in a cast with, you know, bolt with a, you know, the big head bolts and everything else to keep his neck stable. And the judge is sitting there and she goes, Mr. Polly, you're doing a domestic violence case. I said, yes, your honor. Why don't you go ahead and read the, read the charges and the facts. And she starts reading and she's like, <laughs> she starts chuckling on the bench, which is a big no-no for judges. And yeah. she's trying to not laugh. She goes, okay, we have the early intervention plan for this couple. Is that what they want to do? I said, yes, your honor. And then she looks at the man who's standing there and he goes, sir, you know, you're not supposed to hit your wife, right? And he goes, you're not going to do it again, are you? And he goes, no. If I hit her again, she's going to kill me. And no, no, no. She showed me the knife. And then more importantly, her uncle owns a pig farm. They'll never find my body. And I'm like, and the judge goes, yeah, we're not we're not going to go into disposal of bodies at this motion, sir. You just go on to the to the nice counseling for you and it'll all be, it'll all be great. And she looks at me and then she she goes, Mr. Pauly, you never cease to amuse me when you come in my courtroom. And I said, well, you know, judge, you get, you know, you get paid, you get paid to sit here and hear this stuff. I, I wouldn't want to bore you. She goes, no, no, you never bore me. She goes, I don't know where you find these people, but honestly, you, you don't ever bore me. Mm. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Now, have you ever considered now, just in case your book goes into uh, the TV or the movies, I don't know, because it can't. Have you ever considered being a part of it? Because you're you're really funny, even by the way that you tell the stories. You're a good narrator. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I've thought about that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not terribly photogenic, but I certainly could I, I, I could be on the set and be able to make sure that they got the dialogue and my facial expressions right. Because you just, you know, if you haven't been there and you haven't dealt with these people, it's 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 just so hard to sit there and realize that I went to I, I went to university and then three years of law school. I went to a very good law school and I wind up in this really weird place defending people or dealing with people that are thrown through the windows of their caravan. So, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've thought about it because um, people enjoy it when I tell them the stories verbally. Um, and thankfully, from what I've read from people that have read the books that I've known here in Australia, that have talked to me, they said, David, you tell it better in person, but still on paper, it's awfully, awfully funny. I said, mm -hmm. they, and, they, and the people have asked me my entire life if I thought about being a stand-up comedian, uh, you know, some sort of a comedy actor. And I said, yeah, but I never got real motivated by it. But yeah, it would be, it would be really fun if the, if the movie, if the books ever got picked up as a TV series or a movie, just to be able to sit there and, you know, take everybody through it. Mm, that would be good. You're good. And um, yeah, so uh, to those who are watching and those who get to watch after we are through, or uh, those who are going to listen from the podcast platforms that the show is on, we thank you. And we ask you to go and get the book, The Expensive Janitor by David Polly. And uh, moving on, what are the other books? Because I know you've written several books. Maybe you can tell us some of the other books. Oh, sure. Um, the one book I thought would actually sell because it was pretty straightforward was a self-help book entitled, Do I Need a Lawyer? Um, the first version was Traffic Tickets and Drunk Driving. Um, and I wrote it in the same style like those books, you know, math for dummies, that sort of idea. Taking people through stuff where they, where they could solve the problem without having to go see a lawyer. But that's okay. No one, it hasn't gone anywhere. Um, the first set of books I wrote was a fantasy series. Um, I had recently gotten divorced and uh, was sitting in the snow of the mountains of New Mexico with a lot of time on my hands. Um, so I was always curious growing up reading fantasy books as to where they, what would happen after the story ended. You know, the, 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 pro, the Lord of the Rings, the unlikely hero finds the mighty weapon and, you know, a thousand pages later, the Dark Lord is gone. And that's it. That's all we ever know. So I was was curious what would happen to the all the different types of people after the war was over. What would they do? So I sat there and thought about it, um, and 
started, you know, thinking out the plot line. And my inspiration for the plot line um, was inspired by Frank Herbert, who uh, wrote the Dune series, um, in, just in terms of a comp of, of a complex political world. But my main mo inspiration and motivation was at my age, you know, I, I grew up, you know, in the 70s and 80s when the Soviet Union was still the bad guy. Um, and after the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, I really thought that rich Western nations now had the chance to make the world a better place, that they would go ahead and help developing nations, that they would go ahead and reduce poverty, reduce inequity, um, make the world, you know, uh, you know better um, across, across the thing. And that, as we all know, that didn't happen. Um, rich nations got richer, poorer nations got poorer. Um, Western nations supported despots and dictators all over the place, so long as they were getting money and resources out of it. Um, mm -hmm. my, my, my country, the States, you know, we, we like to invade other countries on a regular basis. We're not sure why we go there, but, you know, it's something to do. Get, you know, get to show off our shiny new toys and wreck some other part of the world. So that irritated me. And, and I'm a, a strong environmentalist. So when I saw that all of these Western companies uh, were partnering with other companies to basically destroy the rainforest, pollute the rivers, um, you know, mine rare earth metals and poison the kids. It was just to me diabolical. It was just awful. Mm -hmm. You know, we should know that. We really should, but we don't, and we don't act that way. So yeah. I thought in my, in my fantasy world, I was going to make consequences happen for those kind of bad actions, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So in my in my fantasy world, as each race of, of, of people, elves, dwarves, and men, as they're picking up the pieces and rebuilding their kingdoms, there's a large moderate faction in each race that says, hey, let's get along with everybody else. We all got together to get rid of the bad guy. Let's not become bad guys ourselves. Okay, great. But that wouldn't be a very interesting story. So mm -hmm. in each race, there is a smaller radical faction that wants to keep what they have and take everything that they can from everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the story is set up in the beginning um, with, the, with men, the uh, basically Western European style men um, as the as the preeminent power, then they are engaged in a war of terrible occupation in a country full of brown people. Sounds fairly similar to the Bush Cheney years. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the king doesn't understand why it's not going according to plan. <laughs> and his son points out, uh, gee, dad, you know, when I was down there and I started, you know, making sure the people were treated properly, the rebellion kind of calmed down. And the dad, being the absolute racist jerk that he is, says, no, they must kneel before me. And the son points out that that's not, that that's not working too well for anybody concerned. So it starts out as a big family squabble. And then um, in you, and I'm bringing the backstory into it so the reader is slowly understanding what has, ha what has happened up until this point. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the, 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 the the other prince, not the one that w was the general in the army in the south, the other prince is very nerdy. He's he's the crown prince. He's going to be on the throne. Um, so and you know he's 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 very smart, but he's very weak. He's he's you know he's he's not really up to the job. Mm -hmm. So he leaves the you know he goes out one day, um, discovers something going wrong at a brothel. Um, finds a book of secrets of rich, powerful men whose names are down on the books. Um, so as he's leaving, he winds up getting ambushed and attacked. Mm -hmm. um, and there are several ambushes in the first book um, where the crown prince is riding for his life. Um, nobody knows who's behind it. The king thinks it's his brother. Uh, the king's first minister thinks it's his brother. Uh, the brother is his own worst enemy um, because he has no political skills whatsoever. He simply says what he thinks. So, but during the ambushes, they find um, weapons made by elves, weapons made by dwarves. There's this whole idea of conspiracy that the other races have been involved to some degree to try to destabilize the king of men, you know, the, the kingdom of, of men. Mm -hmm. So I take the reader through all of these different ambushes um, in the first book, Assassins, and introduce the readers to the dwarves and the elves, and they give different bits of hit, you know, talk about different history and different motivations that are going on. Assassins is the first book. 
the second book, Conspiracy, is basically set in the dwarf kingdoms and the elf kingdoms, where a dwarf and elf uh, duo are sent to go find out what they can from their own kingdoms. Um, mm -hmm. And they wind up running into the radical factions in both of their <laughs> worlds and you know barely come out of it alive. Um, because I could, I gave the, I had the faction of the dwarves that's crazy and angry. I made them into fundamentalist religious people because, mm -hmm. you know, why not? Because mm -hmm. in, in my experience growing up Catholic, um, <clears throat> you look back at the history of the Catholic church and it wasn't a very nice organization. <laughs> they did mm -hmm. all sorts of horrible things from the crusades to the destruction of the indigenous people in, 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 you know, in, the, in North and South America. Um, so yeah, I give the I give the priests of the dwarves um, access, the only access to the magic of the dwarves that have been lost over time. They control it. So mm -hmm. while they are less than five percent of the population, they have way more power than they normally would. Mm -hmm. So that's such a very interesting, a very interesting um, paradox. And and that's from your latest book, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, the 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 three. The three fantasy series books, yes, that's from Conspiracy, and then the third one, Myths. Um, the you find out what happens when the when the military prince gets convicted of plotting against his brother, gets sent to the wreckage of the land, you know, the land where the Dark Lord came from, and he gets start being stalked by a supernatural being, and the supernatural being offers him a deal, yeah, you know, right at the end of the story, and the the being says, okay, I'll help you become king. And you can do this. And if you don't agree, I'm going to kill you and your friend. What's your decision? And that's how the book, that's how the first series ends. Mm -hmm. So the second series picks right up and you find out what the prince's decision is and everything else. So, and I'm halfway through writing the second series. I've got most of the stories of men finished. Um, I've just finished writing a chunk of the elves. Um, and then sort of my, my Hobbit substitutes, the Gracies are in the first, in the first series, um, they're trying to help a, you know, a sentient giant insect, uh, preserve their race and preserve their magic. So there's mm -hmm. this really, really, in, really, really interesting story as to how that all ties together for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the end of the story, they basically end of the first series they're asked to become environmentalists go out and look for forests that are untouched look for rivers and streams that aren't polluted and get that information back to some of the other magical beings in my world who will do their best to protect it mm. wonderful wonderful that's great so people should go and get the books and read now we have two comments that uh, we could respond to before we are through with the show and one comment sure. is uh, uh this is in reference to the expensive janitor. Serious issues, but full of fun. That's good of you, David. That's coming from one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Another comment goes uh, uh, in based on the other books that you shared. Varied and correct analysis of the political situation today. The bad guy is done, but where are we? The West, we need to think and do more. Yes, I, I agree with that statement wholeheartedly. And you can take a look. I mean, uh, if you look right now uh, about the, what the West could do, you know, Ukraine is fighting Russia. OK, it's a horrible, horrible war, but yeah. it's not necessarily any more horrible than what happened in Syria, what happened in Rwanda with the genocide. Um, mm -hmm. But those are countries that aren't white and don't have resources. So the West, for the most part, just didn't give a damn. I mean, and it just, it's, it's horrible, but mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I, my, my wife is from Vietnam and uh, obviously I'm in a multicultural family and it just amazes me that even where I grew up in the States, the, the, the racism and the just complete lack of care of anybody that wasn't, you know, your, of European heritage and white is, is just astounding. Um, you, you look at the, you look at the lunatics that are running for political office in the United States today. Um, I mean, they don't want to take America and the world back to 1950. They want to take America and the world back to 1850. You know, they they want to attack gay people. They want to attack um, non-white people. There was in the in the in the brief that was released from the Supreme Court justice, some of the language was su suggesting that not only would they get rid of protections for contraception, I mean, seriously, 
but they were going to go so far as to um, get rid of federal protections for mixed race couples to be married. I mean, mm. seriously, this is yeah. this. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I went to law school. I studied the Constitution. You know, the Constitution specifically states no racist crap, no nonsense. Cut it out. Yeah. That's what the American Civil War was about. Um, and people are willing to re-argue these issues. I mean, and not treat other people as decent human beings. I mean, it, it's just, it, it boggles my mind. I mean, America in the 80s when I grew up, the Republicans believed in small government and personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. That was great. But now they want to make sure that black people can't vote, that women, you know, have, have restrictions on their, you know, on their bodies. I mean, all this stuff. Um, and you see it, unfortunately, with dictatorships, not just in the West, um, but you look at what's happening in China. You look yeah. at the, the the Hindu majority party, Modi, in, uh, if, if I'm correct, the, the prime minister of India is turning the country into a Hindu nationalist party. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's not good if you're one of the 200 million Muslims that live in India. This is mm. bad. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just the fact that we're not willing to let, you know, the people have some dignity and some self-respect and let them know that they have value, even if their, you know, their opinions are different than ours. Yeah, we should all respect one another as long as we are humans. I mean, we should respect one another. And, uh, the best that we can do is uh, show them the right way if they are in the, on the wrong, but not uh, condemn them because uh, right. condemning is what is happening and um, it's, it's not a good issue. Not a good issue. No, mm -hmm. no. And it, it's important that people be allowed to talk and express their ideas. Mm -hmm. When I was in university, when I was my first day at university, I was 17, had never been away from home. And there's a demonstration happening in the middle of the campus, as you as happens in universities. On the one side of the street was the Jewish Defense League, and the other side of the street was the Palestinian Student Organization. Mm -hmm. And they were both shouting at each other, waving their placards and waving their signs and screaming and yelling and shouting. Mm -hmm. um, and I forget who started it, but somebody hit somebody else over the head with a sign. So the whole thing becomes a bit of a brawl. But at the end of it, as I'm watching this, just... 17, you know, completely naive. I'm watching this and eventually a dialogue starts between the two different people. There's just a couple left from each group. Mm -hmm. And they first start out complaining about, you know, your ancestors did this to my ancestors, back and forth and back and forth. Um, and then somebody says, well, that's not getting us anywhere. And they said, no, no, it's not getting us anywhere. Well, maybe we could, maybe my people could do this. Maybe my people could do that. And you could start to see the beginning of this cross-cultural, cross-religious divide starting to be bridged you know, by 18, 19-year-old college students um, that are you know, trying, admitting to take responsibility for what has happened. But instead of focusing on what's happened, let's try to make things better. And I really wish that attitude would be encouraged you know, around the world um, and that people would sit there and say, look, it's one planet. There's a certain amount of resources. Um, and we have to come up with an equitable way to divide the resources so we don't have 0.1% of the United States owning 50% of the United States, which is what it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, protect, protect the environment because one, once we finish cutting down the rainforest, uh, yeah, we're all dead. Um, that's not, not going to be good. Um, so it just, it, it, as, as a, you know, as a person that's been around, been to a few different countries and a few different things, I am just amazed at this resurgence of nationalism, religion, culture wars, all of this stuff, you know, that we thought we got rid of a hundred years ago. No, it's sadly enough, it's it's back. Mm, they're still here. They're that's still here. Un that's unfortunate. But um, yeah, let's keep on talking. Let's keep on encouraging and um, reminding people on the way forward and uh, is to take an action and positive action at that so here we go we really thank you david for coming on to our oh, show thank you. yeah and before you go we would like to know where can we get your books now starting from the expensive uh, janitor and all the other books that you've written where can we get them <clears throat> Um, they're all available on Amazon. If you just type in my name, David Pauly, uh, it'll take you to my Amazon webpage where the books are available in ebook, 
They're available in paperback. Um, my publisher had the all of the books uh, professionally narrated as audiobooks. Um, they're in large print. Uh, they've been translated. Some of them have been translated into French. Some of them have been translated into Spanish. Um, and the next language they're going to be translated into is Japanese. Um, excuse me. Um, my publisher is in the process of getting the books to Kobo, to Nook, Barnes and Nobles. Um, they're available on Goodreads. So, excuse me. There are there are lots of places, but Amazon's a good place to start. Um, and if not, you know, there's lots of other smaller stores around the world that have the books. Wonderful. And we are going to share the link to your Amazon page on our uh, platforms. And we agree that we are going to get the books and read. Okay, yeah. great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, but before you go at Book Talk, we always have someone leave us with some few words that we can always remember. Some good words. It's your time. Right. Um, so what I would say to everybody, aside from my political, you know, the stuff I was talking about, um, <clears throat> my journey as a writer was short. I'm uh, sorry, was, was, was very, took a long time. What I would tell people is I, I struggled and struggled and struggled with my books. Um, they were rejected by every publishing company. I, um, eventually, I had the books rewritten with an editor um, and eventually was able to get my story out. So I would encourage anybody and everybody who's ever thought about writing something down, maybe their life experience, maybe, you know, a fiction novel, just do it. Do it for yourself. Do it for your own self-expression so that you can go ahead, even if it never goes anywhere, nobody reads it. You can sit there and, and have the satisfaction and the sense of accomplishment that you've written something, that it's your work um, and it's your posterity. It's going to live on after we do. Really? So write it down. Don't doubt yourself. Believe in yourself and you can't go wrong. Wow, what a beautiful message to someone out there. And what I always say is that each and every one of us has a story to tell, even a baby who's lived for one day, he yes. has a story to tell. So yeah. go out there and tell your story. Okay, I will, yeah. thank you. And thank you again, David, and all the listeners. It, I'm your host, Anthony Morore, and we are wishing you the best of the best in your life. And at this point is just saying bye me and david goodbye bye